And he has told us in his word that all power is given unto him, and that same power he gives to us. Were it not for God, there would be no assemblies of God. It's revival time on the air coast to coast and round the world. What did you promise God in 1953? Do you face me tonight with broken promises? The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. And I'm glad the church is going forward. I challenge you to take the torch. Carry the torch high in the name of the Lord Jesus. The church of Jesus Christ can make history for God is a God of history. By the middle of the 19th century, a wave of evangelistic enthusiasm had spread across America, carrying the gospel to the edge of the frontier. It looked like nothing could get in the way of this monumental move of God. Then came the Civil War, America's trial by fire, a crisis so large and so bloody, no one was certain the Union could survive. The post-war period forced Americans to search their souls. If the Union could be threatened, what else in their lives might be vulnerable? Their future, their faith. Questions like these drove many to the foot of the cross, but it prompted others to wander away from the teachings of Christ to biblical criticism and modernism, resulting in a social gospel without God's presence or power. For a time, it looked as though the wave of the spirit that characterized the first half of the century had washed up on the beach. But God wasn't finished moving. By the 1890s, small groups of eager, devout believers began exploring the scriptures, poring over the New Testament in search of a biblical model of ministry. That search led them to the account of the first Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2. Early Christians, gathered in an upper room, heard a sound like a rushing wind. The Holy Spirit descended on them. They saw what they described as tongues of fire resting on each of them. They spoke in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Could it be what happened to those first believers was more than an isolated incident? Could the same kind of experience be possible for believers today? Those early believers did more than study. They prayed and worshipped and sought God's presence. And as a result, they received the baptism of the Spirit. They spoke in languages they had not learned, which we call other tongues. They experienced healings. They had a passion to reach people for Jesus who did not know him and who were lost. Their worship was spontaneous and enthusiastic and it so attracted people. And what they found then, we find always now, God is still reaching out to people and ministering to them and saving them and baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. In 1901, Reverend Charles Parham and a group of 40 Bible college students met in an unfinished mansion called Stone's Folly in Topeka, Kansas. They began the new year with a prayer meeting that continued for several days. Many of them received the baptism in the Spirit, complete with the evidence of speaking in unknown tongues. Farther to the west, at the Los Angeles Azusa Street Mission in 1906, William Seymour held evangelistic services and prayer meetings over a three-year period that were so intense so marked by the same kind of evidence of the Spirit, they captured the attention of believers and non-believers alike from around the world. By 1913, there were literally hundreds of congregations and dozens of publications from coast to coast that had come to be called Pentecostal, named after that incredible experience in the first century that was becoming a modern-day reality in so many lives. It was around this time the leaders of several of these groups began to talk seriously about uniting. They felt impressed that joining together in some way might not only fan the flame of revival, but also make them more effective in the work God had given them to do. So the word went out. The notice called for a general convention of Pentecostal saints and Church of God in Christ, and some 300 of them came to Hot Springs. The notice also carried an invitation not to attend. It said, no deadbeats allowed. You have to realize that they were a fiercely independent group and in fact they had to be fiercely independent because many of them had been forced out of uh, their churches. In fact, uh, some of them came to Hot Springs specifically for the purpose of opposing any attempt at unification. 
That's not to say they didn't have a lot in common. What drew these groups together to begin with is the doctrines that they held, which are still the basic doctrines of the church today. That's salvation through Jesus, the Bible is God's inspired word, healing for the sick, the soon return of Jesus, and the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is speaking in tongues. Someone asked J. Rosal Flower the question of uh, what was the significance of the baptism of the Spirit. And his uh, response was that this is not only the, the experience that sets us apart as a fellowship, but it is the empowerment by which the church fulfills the mission of Christ of the earth. And that's in keeping with the words of Jesus, that after the Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive power. And so it's in that power that we actually carry out our evangelism. Knowing that their ranks were divided, the council's leaders opened the meeting by getting right to business, the business of prayer. They sought the Lord together for three straight days. When they got off their knees, they found they really were united and unanimously agreed to become the General Council of the Assemblies of God, a cooperative fellowship. The idea was that each church would be sovereign in its governance. They would elect their own pastor and deacon board, own their own property, uh, set up their own ministry agenda, and uh, at the same time teach the Pentecostal doctrines, protect the Pentecostal distinctive, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and work together as a cooperative fellowship that would take the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. E. N. Bell was elected as the first general chairman. Bell pastored a church in Arkansas and edited a publication called Word and Witness. J. Roswell Flower, an Indiana pastor and editor of the Christian Evangel, became the first general secretary. Together they set up a modest headquarters office in Findlay, Ohio. Using borrowed facilities, they outfitted a printing plant named the Gospel Publishing House. Eventually, their two publications merged. The result was a 16-page magazine called the Weekly Evangel. Later, the name was changed to the Pentecostal Evangel. The new fellowship experienced dramatic growth during the next several years. It outgrew one headquarters facility after another until, in 1918, Leaders bought a two-story abandoned meat market in Springfield, Missouri for $3,000. But God still wasn't finished adding to their numbers. That modest 45 by 58 foot building was expanded five times over the next several years. In 1949, the Gospel Publishing House's print operations moved two blocks up the street on Boonville. Then, in 1961, the General Council joined them at what has become its current home. National Headquarters is a frequent stopping point for tourists visiting the Springfield area. Tourists can now visit the new Flower Pentecostal Heritage Center, a state-of-the-art interactive visitor center designed to help tell the story of the Assemblies of God. Blending artifacts, video clips, and sound bites, the exhibits introduce our history to youth and others who are unacquainted with our church. Plus, the nostalgic, self-guided exhibits of various ministries at home and abroad will bring back wonderful memories to seniors. In addition, the Flower Pentecostal Heritage Center makes available a wealth of resources to persons wishing to research church and family history and theology. But the Assemblies of God is more than buildings. We're about people. Every Sunday, we touch the lives of more than two million people who worship in nearly 12,000 churches. On an average, one new Assembly of God church opens each and every day, and that's just in the United States. Worldwide, we are part of an Assemblies of God fellowship that comprises by far the largest of all Pentecostal groups. There are many today in uh, the church circles that look upon the Pentecostal church and say, what makes that church uh, accomplish what it has accomplished? Well, it hasn't been our organization, it hasn't been our ingenuity, it hasn't been our cleverness. It hasn't been our resources. It's been the person of the Holy Spirit. The reason the Assemblies of God has been so powerful throughout the world is that the Scriptures is eternal and universal, and it is truth that's settled in heaven, not questioned by man. We believe in the power of God to change lives. We believe in the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit to be active and real in our midst. People do not come to our churches because we have good performances. They come to our churches because the power of the gospel is true 
and being manifested in our lives. As long as we focus on that, we will continue to see God do amazing things that only He can do. The role of the 1,000 staff members and leaders at National Headquarters is to preserve that focus and provide resources and support to the local congregations on the front lines of ministry. Besides carrying out the decisions of the General Council, which meets every other year, Headquarters functions like a service agency, providing administrative leadership, directing missions programs, developing support materials and curriculum, and carrying out other specialized outreaches. Among the most familiar of these is the Pentecostal Evangel, one of the largest Protestant weekly publications in America, with a circulation of more than a quarter million. Our goal is to educate, motivate, and inspire believers. And for many years, this publication has served the fellowship well, helping to knit churches together for the common purpose of spreading the gospel. An important part of our job is to be a point of contact for Pentecostals around the world, to be a town square, if you will, for the people of this fellowship, and to report how the Holy Spirit is moving in America and around the globe. Work at the headquarters complex in Springfield is carried out by six divisions. Foreign missions, home missions, Christian education, church ministries, publication, and treasury. But a passion to reach the lost is a common thread running through every plan or program. In fact, evangelism has been a top priority from the beginning. The very first year that the General Council existed, 15 missionaries were commissioned to carry the gospel overseas. As the fellowship grew, so did our commitment to share Christ. Today, nearly 2,000 missionaries are reaching out in Jesus' name in some 152 countries around the world. Actually, from the very beginning, the Assemblies of God set out to plant indigenous churches around the world. Churches that are native, natural to the soil in which they're planted. That means that uh, training leaders is a vital part of what we do. Leaders from the churches to lead the churches. Sounds obvious, doesn't it? But in the last few years, with borders closing, visas being refused to missionaries, the church goes right on. It continues to grow and multiply because it's led by its own people. Today, there are more than 30 million people involved in Assemblies of God congregations abroad, more than 10 times the size of our constituency here in the U.S. Thousands of men and women are enrolled in more than 1,000 Bible schools overseas, learning to bring leadership to our next generation of ministry. By God's grace, the Assemblies of God missions program is among the most zealous and fruitful in the world. Here at home, our outreach efforts are every bit as enthusiastic. There are specialized ministries to Hispanics, Native Americans and other ethnic groups, prison ministries, outreaches to the poor, the deaf, the blind, anyone and everyone in need of help and hope. Teen Challenge to me is probably one of the greatest missions in America without leaving America. These fellows who were hardened and were con artists basically, uh, are now all of a sudden loving God. I was doing drugs every day. I was dealing drugs so that I could get more money to buy more drugs, so that I could do drugs, so I could deal more drugs. And that became the lifestyle. I was arrested for a particular burglary and put in jail at the age of 17. I was out of jail for one month and my parents came back and said, you have three options. You can return to jail and we're going to remove our bond. We're going to remove our bond and you can run.